So recently we've heard a lot of discussion regarding the individual Richard Allen, someone who by all accounts inserted himself into the Delphi investigation at a very early stage. This individual, however, seemed to be beyond suspicion. Someone who perhaps wasn't taken seriously at the time. Someone who by all accounts approached a conservation officer shortly after the discovery of the bodies and said, yes, I was there that day. I was on the bridge that day, that afternoon in fact. No, I didn't see the girls, but I was most definitely in the area. Someone who actually matched the description of the man seen in the video in front of you. A short individual, maybe middle-aged, white. Someone who had their hands in their pockets, who didn't seem to be concerned regarding walking over a dangerous bridge with no handrails. Someone who looked like he'd done that before, perhaps. Someone who was familiar with the area. Potentially a local man. So how did things go so wrong here? And does this case share some parallels also with a case from this country, the Sower murders and Ian Huntley? So firstly, let's focus on the individual Richard Allen. I've heard a lot of discussion of this being a brazen and confident individual, someone who's maybe even used to manipulating law enforcement. But at this point in time, do we really have enough information to make those kind of assumptions? We've heard talk of this being a potential serial killer. Again, I'm not here to neither confirm nor deny that possibility, but I think we need to look at all avenues here regarding this individual. Could it simply be that Richard Allen was walking across the bridge that day? Maybe he thought that he had been seen by someone, maybe even someone he knew. Maybe it was panic that sent him to law enforcement that day. We don't really know the state of mind, do we, of the individual at that particular moment. We don't know if this was a preconceived idea that I'll commit these murders, I'll hand myself in or I'll, I'll say I was near the crime scene. They won't believe for one second it was me. I'm, you know, I'm a master manipulator. I'll be able to get through any interview that they throw at me. We don't know. We don't know the state of mind of the individual concerned. Now, regarding Richard Allen approaching this conservation officer, by all accounts, he said, yes, I was on the bridge. No, I didn't see the girls. And he was subsequently overlooked or suspicion was taken away from Richard Allen after this point. But what we don't know is if there was any follow-up by law enforcement. We don't know how in-depth that follow-up was. We don't know if Richard Allen had some kind of uncrackable alibi. Did his wife say that she was with him? Did a work colleague or friend say that they were with him during the time that these murders were committed? We don't have that information at this stage. But I think we can all agree that something has gone terribly wrong between the time that Richard Allen came forward to say that he was near the scene of the crime and his subsequent arrest in 2022. One of the aspects of this investigation which does confuse me, however, is that it seemed in 2019 during the press conference, the press conference held by Doug Carter, that they were on the right track at that stage. This was a local individual, someone who they had maybe interviewed or spoken to members of their family. Someone who may be even hiding in plain sight. It seemed at that point in time, they were on the right track. Yet, then in 2020, we have the pursuit of Keegan Klein, the, the interview with Keegan Klein. And the interviewers there, the, the detectives, really seem adamant that there's some kind of link between the Anthony Schott's profile, Keegan Klein, and the perpetrator of these murders. So it appears from an outsider looking in, which is exactly what all of us individuals are at this point, it looks like this investigation is very disjointed. There's no congruency here in terms of individuals leading from one to another. It's almost like we've got the killer who's come forward very early on, literally the day of the murders or maybe the day after, we don't know. But he's come forward to law enforcement to say, I was on the bridge that day. He's been overlooked or cleared, whatever you want to call it. They've then moved on to different avenues. Ron Logan, Keegan Klein. But in between that, we have that 2019 press conference where they believe that they've interviewed this guy. It's a local man, someone who knows the area, someone who's hiding in plain sight. Hiding in plain sight. 
Do you mean, what, two miles away from the bridge? Someone who has actually come forward to you and said that he was there that day? Because to me, you could connect that and say, yes, that's what he was referring to. But from that point in time, we then move on to Keegan Klein, as I say, and the Anthony Schott's profile, and the sea sam ring, and the deeper connections. And now we've gone almost full circle again, and we're back to Richard Allen, the local Delphi resident. For me personally, one of the more interesting words in that Wish TV article regarding Richard Allen coming forward to that conservation officer is the usage of the word unfounded. The report was deemed unfounded. Now, do they mean unfounded in terms of the person who took the report? Was it very brief and just didn't seem right at the time? Or are they talking about the mental health of the person that gave that report? Did they believe that it was someone who was just, as I say, inserting themselves into this investigation for some kind of popularity? Bear in mind that this is a very small community. It's not beyond the realms of possibility for a local person to come forward and insert himself into the spotlight, so to speak. I was there. No, God, no, I didn't see the girls, but I was there. Christ, you know, God, I must have just missed them. You know, that's not beyond the realms of possibility for someone to do that. What I would like to draw your attention to now is a very brief clip of a man by the name of Ian Huntley, someone who also inserted himself into a police investigation, someone who was also part of a search party when looking for two missing girls. It was Britain's biggest manhunt ever. Hundreds of police officers and volunteers all focused on the quiet village of Soham in Cambridgeshire. Holly Wells and Jessica Chapman, both aged 10, had vanished on their way to the local sweet shop. Soham College caretaker Ian Huntley, apparently the last person to have seen the girls, told the TV cameras he'd noticed nothing unusual. It seemed fine, very cheerful, happy, chatty. Ian Huntley had put himself at the centre of the search for Holly and Jessica. But what did his interviews reveal? Our experts watched, listened, and analysed. He starts his sentence with the girls, which sounds a little bit familiar. He realises that, and he backs off and says, well, I don't know the girls. Well, the girl, I don't know the girls. Um... So that false start is showing us that he's trying to manage an impression. He's also trying to pose an expression of sadness or concern with his eyebrows. And we know it's a pose because there's a symmetry. The, the, the eyebrows aren't level. His right hand brow is two, three millimetres higher than his left. And this is what happens when you try and fake concern. Genuine sadness is shown with symmetrical eyebrows. How do they seem to you? They seem fine, very cheerful, happy, chatty. What we have here is him describing the girls as being happy and chatty and he's forgotten to take the sad expression off his face is indicator one of deception. Indicator two, he's contradicting these affirmative statements with a slight head shake, no. And in addition, we've got gestural leakage from his shoulder. It's raising a couple of millimetres on his right-hand side, which contradicts the positive affirmative statements he's making. That is a strong signal of deception. I think fine, very cheerful. That's number one. Happy, chatty. That's number two. It's a very slight movement of his right hand shoulder. The raising of the shoulders signal, I don't know. But if I'm saying something affirmative and I want you to believe me, and it leaks from one or other of the shoulders, and it's small, then that is a contradiction. His body is questioning that statement. It's a contradiction. So Ian Huntley was also an individual who inserted himself into a police investigation. Someone who was part of the search party looking for the two missing girls. And someone who also went as far as to say he was the last individual to see them before they disappeared. Now to give you a little bit of context regarding Delphi and Soham, maybe a, a comparison if you will. Soham holds around 11,000 residents, so a lot bigger than Delphi. And this case back when it happened was absolutely huge. Absolutely huge in this country. 
massive news coverage, massive media attention throughout the country. Up and down the country, everybody was aware of these two missing girls. Now, one monumental difference between this case from the UK and that of the Delphi murders is that police were able to crack this case and even sentence Ian Huntley within two years. This was a case that actually involved a false alibi. Ian Huntley had a false alibi. They managed to crack the alibi. They managed to recover items of clothing. And they were on to Ian Huntley at a fairly early stage. I'm just going to read a very small paragraph from Wikipedia which explains this in more detail. Having participated in the search for the children, Huntley regularly asked police officers questions such as how their investigation was progressing and how long DNA evidence could survive before deteriorating. One of these officers observed three vertical scratches on Huntley's left jaw, each measuring approximately three centimetres, which he claimed had been recently inflicted by his dog. On the 16th of August, 12 days after the children's disappearance, Huntley and Carr were first questioned by police. Now, interestingly, they were on to Ian Huntley at a fairly early stage, as I said earlier. Even when they brought him in for questioning, they still hadn't recovered the bodies or even found the bodies of these two poor girls. Yet in the Delphi murders, we had video of the perpetrator, the voice of the perpetrator, a town that is far smaller than Soham. Soham has 11,000 residents. What is going on here? I don't want to hear this, oh, they had 50,000 tips. They had 70,000 tips. They're not inept. They're not, you know, they haven't done anything wrong. They've just, you know, made a few mistakes. It's, it's unbelievable, actually. It's, it should be classed as unbelievable. A giant cock-up, to use a phrase from this country. How do we have a case here with almost two or three times more people where this crime took place? Two or three times more residents. And within 12 to 13 days, despite even finding the bodies, they're on the trail of the killer. They've got the killer. They, they've got him where they, where they want him, in police custody. And less than two years later, he's sentenced. They've already gone through the trial. Yet almost six years later, we're now just finding out information regarding someone who lived down the road from the bridge. How has this been overlooked? Now, I would wholeheartedly agree that using a term such as inept and phrases such as, you know, there's been failures in this investigation, I would say that that would be fairly harsh if Richard Allen resided on Mars or didn't fit the profile of the man walking across the bridge. They had all of the information in front of their eyes. So how do we not see this as inept? These are professionals. These are people who supposedly dedicate their lives to their profession in order to be the best that they can. Not only that, but they had the best of the best, the FBI, working on this case. Yet something somewhere has gone completely awry. Something is really incredibly wrong, I believe, with this case. And I don't know whether there's, more, there's something deeper going on here. I've got no idea. Hopefully, in time, all will be uncovered. Clearly, there are many parallels to be drawn between the case in Soham and the Delphi murders. And it shouldn't have been beyond consideration that the killer may come forward and insert himself into this case, as was shown in the case concerning Ian Huntley. This is something that does happen from time to time, that perpetrators insert themselves into investigations to find out how that investigation is going, what evidence they have, and really to try and put themselves at the forefront in order to avoid suspicion. Anyway, please be sure to leave your own thoughts, feelings and theories in the comment section below. I'll be sure to check those out and respond where I can. And as always, if you're new to the channel, please do consider subscribing, give the video a thumbs up. And as always, many thanks for joining me for this particular video. I look forward to seeing you all again for the next one. Take care. Cheers.